The Louisiana Restaurant Association presents Conversations in the COVID Crisis, a special edition podcast to capture the stories of our industry during the most unprecedented of times. Now, here are your hosts, LRA President and CEO, Stan Harris, and Vice President of Communications, Wendy Warren. On this episode of Conversations in the COVID Crisis, we're going to talk to a franchisor, a franchisee, and a multi-unit operator here in Louisiana. But first, we're going to hear from Stan and Newell Norman of WWL Radio here in New Orleans. They did an interview together um, earlier this week, and Stan gave some very um, good insight as to what we're dealing with here in Louisiana restaurant land. And we felt that it was so good, and we got such a good response um, immediately from folks that were listening that we thought we would share it with you. So here is Stan Harris, President and CEO of the LRA, and Noel Norman of WWL Radio. Enjoy. Stan Harris, President and CEO of the Louisiana Restaurant Association, joins us. Uh, Stan, I was looking at some of the numbers that y'all presented in your industry. Welcome to the show. Uh, They are staggering. Yeah, thank you, Noel. They are. It's it's overwhelming. It's a it's it's hard to uh, put this in terms that a normal business person can get their hands around. Yeah, I mean, when we think about uh, this, and obviously as a result of a lot of the social distancing measures and everything else that had to take place, a lot of restaurants try to survive with just takeout. I have noticed over the last two weeks that the, those numbers are decreasing and diminishing as well. Yeah, we, we've seen a couple of come back in there. I know that uh, uh, Kushan is, is trying it again and in and, and the link group here in New Orleans. So uh, hopefully they've got something figured out that will work because the goal is to try to keep as many of your people employed right now. And, uh, you know, our last survey that we did nationally about three weeks ago, uh, 44% of the restaurants had temporarily closed and 56% were trying the off-premise model. We've got another survey going right now that, I'm, I'm guessing we'll show, much like you uh, surmised, that, that we've got a lot less restaurants operating today under the to-go or takeout model or delivery model, just simply because they, they just don't know how long this is going to last, and is it a triage and a bridge to something, or what the next steps are. Curiosity-driven, uh, in talking to uh, your association members, are there many of them taking advantage of the PPP, or does that not really align well for their business model? The, the challenge of the PPP is that everyone wants to believe that there's something good for them in every program. And the payroll protection for our industry is, is really the forgiveness is going to be based on uh, how quickly you bring enough of your workforce back to get that level of forgiveness. My guidance and our guidance from the LRA has been, if you need liquidity, this might be a very good way to borrow money at half a percent for two years. But if you need a longer term window of liquidity, you might look at the economic injury disaster loans or some other line of credit against your business. The state LED and Secretary Pearson with the Bankers Association created a guaranteed uh, liquidity program for small business here up to 100 employees. You can borrow up to $100,000. It has a state guarantee and can have a five-year term with a very low interest rate. And it also includes businesses that aren't typically included, bars, video poker places, people that, that rely on video poker casinos. Those things can, this might provide some immediate liquidity for them. You know, to put this in context, uh in one of the uh, information uh, circulars that you have, in the first 22 days of March, there was an estimated $292 million loss in sales. I mean, when I read that number, it, it's staggering. Yeah, na- nationally, our communication with White House, and we've got, we had a call with them earlier today, uh, is that we're, we're going to see an impact if this continues of probably $225 billion to restaurant sales. That is mind-boggling. 
Yeah, I mean, and you guys are the heartthrob in many respects of small business, right? I mean, you are the, when you think of small business, restaurants are the traditional thing, bars, neighborhood uh, outlets that you think of first. Absolutely. When you look at, at our typical member, and while we have chain members and we have people that have multiple locations across our region, our average member does under a million dollars in sales has 15 to 20 employees, has most of their net worth tied up in illiquid leasehold improvements in a building they don't own. But they have this dream, they have this drive, they have great product, they treat people well, they're respectful of their guests and their employees, and they believe that they can do it better than the guy down the street. And that's what drives the industry, and thank God for it, because it is entrepreneurship in the purest form. So, Stan, we know that that's why a lot of people not only around the United States, but around the world, enjoy coming to this region, is what you just stated. How do, Are you all looking at what this new world order is going to be coming out of this? You know, I did an interview yesterday with, a, with the Oyster Task Force on something they were doing, and I reminded them that it's not just how we prepare food in Louisiana and New Orleans specifically that brings people here. It's what we have to prepare oysters, shrimp, fin fish, crabs, all of this great bounty of, of products that come from our agricultural community. This really drives people's uh, uh, desire to come here. And when we start looking at recovery, we know it's going to be very different than how we operated pre-March the 1st. So what are y'all seeing? I mean, I guess you know, I was just kind of taken aback uh, yesterday by the mayor's comments, in, in the, and I'm, again, I'm going to qualify this. I'm not being critical, but I think that those uh, festivals were probably going to cancel anyway because of their difficult, you know, production challenges that they were going to have. Having said that, to just make this generalized statement as though we just don't want anybody from outside of this area coming here, we don't want to run that risk in the fall. When you're a a tourism industry town and so many of these restaurants rely on tourism, that's not sending a real rosy message that basically we're going to write off 2020? Well, you know, I don't think any business can have hope as their strategy or any industry. And there was no question that we were somewhat blindsided by that because we are having regular scheduled ongoing communication with the mayor When this started, we were doing it multiple times a day. It it wound down to seven days a week, and now it's three to five days a week. So we've had great access, and this was just somewhat of a surprise. And I think you'll see her pivot just a little bit to to try to be a little bit more expansive in in what she was was meaning, but also limiting uh, the the impact broadly. But we're, we're going in the land of the great unknowns. And you know, when you when you tell people that have tried to push as much business as they can into the third and fourth quarter, uh, you know, we've got a trade show that we do in August. I don't know if the convention center will be back or not, but we're holding on to that right now because we think it's going to be an important place to convene people to talk about what business is going to look like going forward. Yeah, I mean, you you may have to take the remedial measures necessary as much as possible and, and so forth and so on. Um maybe even part of it being virtual. But the the thing is, is that at some point in time, we, we have to create momentum. Uh, there, there's no doubt know. about it. You know, the, the cities know and the state knows they're going to have big holes in sales taxes. Uh, they're not picking up video poker and gaming taxes right now. Uh, we're going to have a massive hole in, in a state that was already under some pretty significant stress. I think, you know, we have great access to the governor's team. We have a call with them almost every day. Uh, They've given us uh, a lot of uh, input and and also have taken a lot of our feedback. We we feel like he's going to announce his recovery approach in the next day or so. Uh, They've been putting together groups of of 15 of the large industry drivers. I don't want to jump ahead of this, but I I think that's a smart approach. Now, he has said that, that, that they're meeting, and he created this task force, which I think is smart. I mean, to hear from from everybody, because as you said, we're in uncharted territory, and, and no one's an expert in this field right now. <laughs> and that well, happened, we're gonna, right? <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to address behavioral changes, too. You know, we're used to, we're, we're a hugging, slap on the back, let's get together and go eat some oysters at the oyster bar kind of town. 
Um, and, and that's going to be uh, different going forward. I think the recovery process has to include a bunch of different elements. One is we've got to allow our supply chain to restock. Uh, the large broadline distributors, a lot of them have stopped bringing in fresh produce and fresh meats and poultry and things like that. Uh, they've got, they're going to have challenges getting their workforce reengaged. We've got a great program to help the workforce in the industry, paying them up to $847 a week. But that's going to make it hard to attract people to return to work. And yeah. then, you know, how, how do you do social distancing in a warehouse? Then the restaurant has to figure out. I was talking to a member yesterday about this. So let's say your, your normal kitchen has 12 people in it and you're limited to six. What does your menu look like? Do you have right. to limit the steps? Do you have to restructure your menu? And then we're probably going to have some wage inflation and some price inflation that will impact that as well. Which puts more stressors on small business. Absolutely. And, and, and again, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at this. I, I serve on the National Restaurant Association Board, and we're working with our ServeSafe team that does food safety and sanitation training to really look at what are these best practices that we can consider for an industry as we deal with our employees, as we deal with our guests. Because dealing, building trust with the guest is going to be critical to having long-term recovery. That's really going to be important. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Stan Harris, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to try and bring you on, um, you know, at least every other week if you're amenable to that because uh, you have a lot of incredible and valuable information that I think people want to hear. Happy to do it. Tell them to visit our website at LRA.org. Plenty of information there. Absolutely, LRA.org. Stan Harris, thank you so much. President and CEO of the Louisiana Restaurant Association. Next up on the podcast is Scott Taylor, COO and President of Walk-On's Bistro and Bar, and also an LRA member, and he's the Communications Chair for the State Board this year. Welcome, Scott. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks for having me. I am just so excited to hear a friendly voice. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to talk to friendly people on the phone. Yes, sure. definitely. It's not the same as in, the par- in person, but um, I do believe oh, the... Yeah. Last time we were together, we were in the French Quarter the first weekend of Mardi Gras, getting ready for our first board meeting of the year. So Yeah, um, I know. Kind of an interesting time had we known then, right? No, uh, we did geez. not know then. <laughs> uh, I know. We I'm had to stay out too late one night. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I am very interested in um, hearing how things are going over at Walk-Ons. I know you guys had a super, super aggressive expansion plan uh, for last year, this year, I think going forward a little bit in the future, but how has this franchise or franchisee relationship kind of um, evolved? Um, I'm sure there's a lot of differences. Like, yeah, with, it's, yeah. It's so tell me all about so it. We've opened, we've opened five franchise locations this year. One opened in College Station, three weeks before they were told to close. And then one opened in Spring, Texas, Houston area. uh, And during their opening week, they were told to close. So they actually opened, their grand opening was curbside and uh, carry out their third part delivery. So they haven't even, they they had a staff of 220 and they had to kind of just release 90% of that staff, you know, to come back when we right. can get up to, you know, finish the training, but halfway through the training weeks, like, man, it's just wasting money because you can't use them. Right. So, uh, so we've had all kinds of scenarios, but, you know, all of our locations are under a, you know, closed dining room order, mm-hmm. doing curbside, takeout, drive through, whatever we can do, neighborhood drops. And so I think the, what's been great for us is, we kept a really good open line of communications. Um, I sent a daily email uh, to all of our franchisees, updating them on the latest with you know uh, government uh, support, funding, things from the LRA, things that I find uh, in the industry, just news to kind of keep them up to date, right. as well as positive messaging. You know, we've set up a prayer group on Facebook that has 100 percent participation, which is kind of crazy. Wow! Uh, and just you know, positive encouragement. So I think it's, it's it has to be a mix of business information. Uh, hey, we're in this together, and then you know, realize that maybe this isn't happening to us; it's happening for us. And you got to find positive in everything. And and so uh, we 
we're just we're just trying to stay close knit as we can as a franchise family. And how many franchisees are we talking here? And how many employees are in the walk ons world? Yeah, so franchisees about forty, thirty seven mm-hmm. stores, and each store has about two hundred or so employees. So I mean, you no know, over seven thousand hourly wow. team members. And, you know, of which probably 80% of the hourly team members have been furloughed mm. just because we, we can't open our bar. We can't seat the dining room. And so there's there's no way to to have them come to work. So that's been tough. But, you know, the other thing I think is important that we've been doing is we, you know, since the day we had to close, we've continued to offer a free meal to every employee to come every day, seven days a week, just come by. So it's a, re- it's a way for us to stay in touch. You know, they, they come by and, and it's different. It's not just a burger. Sometimes it's some, you know, just a different chef gets creative and, and we have a different meal every day. But we've been able to stay in touch. And then we, we communicate with our hourly team at least twice a week through mm-hmm. hot schedules, just, you know, keeping them up to date. What's going on? Right. Hey, we're, we're doing everything we can, you know, to get reopened. Or, hey, there's some opportunities with some additional business we picked up and, and uh, just trying to keep them engaged. So when we're told we can go back, Hopefully all our people right. are ready to go. Yeah. So what um, that kind of brings you, you talked about it, but you didn't say the name of the initiative. Yeah. So uh, we've done a bunch of, well, Furlough Kitchen is one that we uh, kind of partnered with. It's an interesting deal because it, we, a friend of mine is the CEO for Front Burner Restaurants in Dallas. And they, they have whiskey cake, Mexican sugar. He was actually the founder of Twin Peaks and sold that brand, but you know, in Texas, we are absolute head-to-head competitors. And okay. uh, I saw he was doing something with furlough there, and I said, man, we we like the idea, and I don't want to just steal it from you. Let's, how do we partner? And so, you know, three weeks ago, we, we struck a partnership, and, and we brought that furlough kitchen mission to Louisiana, and then as well on to Mississippi, Alabama, North Carolina, back in Texas. And we're running nine to ten furlough kitchens a week across the southeast. And do you have a so, schedule for the... Um, like, is there a certain day at a certain store, or is it every day at every store? Every store is a little different. So you can go to furloughkitchen.org and click on walk-ons. That gives you the uh, information, or you can go to the gameonfoundation.org, which is our 501c. And the schedule, you know, is different. So the original walk-ons in uh, Baton Rouge does it every Tuesday and Thursday from 2 to 5. Homa does it from 2 to 5, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Some do it on Saturdays. Okay. And it really just kind of, you know, because they're franchise locations, uh, and, you know, everybody's tight for money. So we we tried to raise money through uh, different sponsorships, and we provide, you know, cash that we raise to the franchisees to be able to operate a furlough kitchen, pay, you know, pay for the food, help offset the labor. Right. But the key is they have to bring back our only employees who've been furloughed to work it. So we're not going to oh, help them. Okay. It was just the managers cooking. We want a line cook, a server, a hostess, or somebody who hasn't been working to come back to work that day, get paid, um, and, and be part of the team, you know, whether it's two days a week, you know, three days a week, whatever it is. Okay. So is there anything that you've learned about the franchise or franchisee relationship that you didn't know before? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things we did with our franchisees the week after uh, all the restaurants were closed is we abated royalties. And, and I don't, uh, we're probably one of uh, a small handful of franchisors that took that step because we went back and looked at it. You know, if you're a franchisor, your, your income comes from royalties from different right. locations, you know, and, and you figure our, our average unit is a little over 5 million, 5%. That's a quarter million dollars a year per location. We just said we're not going to collect royalties, and we, we abated for four weeks. We actually will collect royalties for the first time this Monday. Okay. And, uh, you know, since since everybody's ordered close, I think that was a big step in the relationship. It was a financial hit for us, uh, but it was also the point telling our franchisees that, man, you need to keep the money you got coming in, pay your staff. Let's figure out how we get stabilized, fortunately – a lot of the PPP money is coming out this week, so the timing worked out great um, to kind of come back in and restart, you know, our royalties. But and it's, it's uh, it, it, I think the big thing is getting everybody to understand this is a moment of time, not the end of time, yeah. and that we'll come out of this stronger. And so, you know, we, we just need to do what's right for us and the business today, right. knowing that we're in a long-term relationship and one month's royalties isn't going to make or break us when we're together for 10, 15 years. Exactly. That's a good way to look at it. 
Um, what about the LRA has helped you through this process? So you know, it just made me that? realize what a stud Stan Harris is. He is <laughs> <a> walking. <laughs> I was literally text. I was listening to uh, his uh, pod, his uh, webinar right before you called, and he just is so smart. <laughs> and so I've been able to reach out to him different times and just ask his advice. Uh, at you know, at a group of us together getting advice from Stan on what to do, how to navigate things, and so I just think the partnership. The, uh, the camaraderie of the LRA, uh, just people, everybody's in the same boat. We're all, we may be competitors certain days, but man, we're restaurant tours today and, and we all have the same fight. So we look good together. We look bad together. Let's come out of this mm-hmm. thing. Let's be strong. Let's be the best, cleanest, you know, safest restaurants to open across the country in Louisiana first. And I think that's the mission everybody's committed to. So LRA has been huge, huge, uh, benefit to our communications with our restaurants our teams and man i check out texas i check out north carolina i check out every state restaurant association and nobody holds a candle to what lra is doing how it's being communicated the information being provided so well yeah, thank it's you something to be proud of i track them too <laughs> i know i know you do and i look and i'm because i'm like hey maybe there's something specific for texas I'm like man but it's like and I, I even have friends uh, with the FRLA. I'm like, man, y'all got to get on the ball. Like, you're missing out. <laughs> you're not giving out the information. You got uh, a lot of restaurants looking for stuff, and they're asking me. And I'm uh, like, uh, okay, well, here's what we're doing in Louisiana. Why don't you, you need to call your boys in Tallahassee and figure it out? <laughs> well, those <laughs> might be fighting words. We might have to edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are. LSU is playing Florida State soon, so we might as well start the smack talking now okay. with the restaurant association. All right, now. You said it. <laughs> Well, thank you for being on with us today and sharing Absolutely. your insight. Good um, stuff. We're going to be stronger in the end, I'm telling you. Yeah. I think this is going to be a time for the restaurants to, uh, I think customers have found a new convenience and figured out full-service restaurants can do things they never could before, and we're just going to be better and stronger when it's all said and done. Well, so thanks for having me, Wendy. From your lips to God, God's ears. <laughs> thank yeah, you. I hope so. <laughs> well, take care. Stay all safe. Right. Can't wait to see you in person. Okay, you too. Joining us next on the podcast is Greg Hamer Sr., a past LRA chair and an also a past NRA EF chairman. How are you doing today, Greg? Fine. How are you doing today, Wendy? I've been better. I could do for seeing some people right now. But I really want to talk to you about being a Taco Bell franchisee in the COVID crisis. Do you have any uh, information you can share with us about what your experience has been like? Well, it's, uh, as everybody knows, it's, it's uh, been a unique experience for everyone. Uh, we have uh, kind of changed everything we do. Uh, for one thing, there's very little uh, traveling around, we pretty much uh, changed that. Our office staff has been working from home for the last couple of weeks, and uh, all that seems to be working pretty good. We we prepared ourselves to uh, to do that electronically, so we were working on it about a week before we actually had to go to it. As far as our restaurants, um, you know, we've got. Uh, some areas that that haven't been affected too much in, in uh, Texas, uh, Louisiana has been running uh, substantially uh, lower than I mean uh, bigger negatives than, than our Texas stores have. Uh, and that's because primarily of the timing, correct? Yeah, it, it's actually you know we've got hot spots in Louisiana that haven't really developed in any of our Texas markets as of yet. Yeah. So. Uh, they're hoping they can avoid that. But uh, have you closed any stores? We've actually closed one store, um, a rural store up in North Louisiana, in a small town that was uh, a good distance away from any of our neighboring restaurants. And we actually had the manager uh, test positive in a small crew where she had worked with everybody. So we basically had to close the whole store. Uh, and so. Uh, that's been done and we 
we're not going to be able to reopen that store probably until she, you know, uh, you know passes her, gets gets a clear yeah. bill of health from it. And what about um, your, can you give me a comparison between maybe your uh, city stores and your rural stores? Like, is um, are your city stores doing a fair amount of business? Well, uh, as a company, we, we've been down, it's, it's fluctuated. You know, when this thing first hit, we went as high as 40% negative for a couple of days. And then we, we spent um, about a week... Uh, Around average around 35 percent negative and another week around 30 this week it looks like we're going to be 25 something like that we had a, um, a good day yesterday but then we uh that we run they've been running a special every tuesday so that's why tuesday oh it's the of, free doritos locos tacos right yeah they've been giving oh. away free tacos so people <laughs> come when you give away free, free stuff i heard about uh, that <laughs> so this was the third week they did that um, but we haven't seen a whole great deal of difference between our rural stores and our city stores. Um, we have had in, in New Orleans proper, uh, we've had a couple of stores that were closed for 24 hours or 48 hours um, where uh, someone on the crew did come, did test positive. And so we, you basically had to close the restaurant, sanitize everything, get everybody that was working with that person out of the restaurant and bring, bring in. people in from other uh, from other restaurants to, to get the restaurant open again. So gotcha. uh, we've had that happen a couple of times, uh, and they've gotten back open. Uh, we haven't heard of any of our people that are that are have been very real sick. You know, we've yeah. had some tested positive, but none of them that we're aware of that have really tested real sick. And what are you guys talking about, like going forward? What does this look like beyond? Like when we're ready to reopen, are you guys talking about social distancing and dining room layouts and things like that? Yeah, we were able to get enough uh, mask last week that we were able to put all our drive-through cashiers a mask. Okay. Uh, we we didn't get it. We couldn't get enough to put our entire crews. We've been told we had a call yesterday with uh, Taco Bell corporate, and they informed us that they would have a mask for everybody by the end of next week. So we're hoping by the end of next week we can have all our crews a mask. Um, and naturally, we're like everybody else. We drive through only. We don't have any right. um, no, no lobby business. Um, I think our big concern going forward is we started, uh, we got funded. We were notified by the bank that we were funded last Thursday night. Mm-hmm. And so Friday morning, we, we started hiring people back. Um, it looks like we were down about with cut with the hours we cut because we cut all um, we cut out breakfast so we don't open around ten o'clock in the morning. Um, we close in early, depending on the jurisdictions. Some mm-hmm. jurisdictions have us close in as early as seven o'clock. Others they don't have any jur- any rules of when we close. So we cut. It appears from our payroll that we had cut about a, about a, a third of our uh, full time equivalents. Okay. So with the funding, we trying to hire them all back now. And I think our concern there, my real concern going forward, especially in Louisiana, is um, with what the unemployment insurance is going to be paying mm-hmm. if people are going to be willing to come back to work. Right. Uh, that's that's a concern. Um, Ultimately, is this going to drive up wages in the long run? Yeah, and and the problem is with what the hourly rate is in Louisiana, we and I don't see how we can afford to pay it, pay a sufficient rate to get people to come back to work if they choose not to, unless the government tightens down on the on the uh, on that. They're not they're going to have a hard time across the South, uh, yeah. getting people to go back to work. It, I don't think it's going to be a big deal in New York, but it's going to be a big deal across the South where the standard, where the cost of living is a lot less. Yeah, it's a um, it's a different time. Um, yeah, you know we'll see how we'll have to just navigate through it the best we can. But I appreciate you taking time with me today. All right, and, dear. Um, you know, if there's anything I can do for you guys, let me know. And um, this will be on episode four, and we're. Um, we're grateful for your support of the industry and for your support of the LRA. Thank you, All sir. All right. Well, thank you. Have a good day. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye.
Next on the podcast is Paul Hudson, CEO of Taste Buds Management here in the greater New Orleans area, operating Zia Rotisserie and Bar, Semolina and Taste Buds Catering um, with 11 operations in Mississippi and along um, the I-10 corridor, I would say, in Louisiana, correct? That's correct. All right. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So we're going to talk about what it's like to be a multi-unit operator in this COVID crisis environment. So will you tell me a little bit about what you guys are doing Mm -hmm. right now to, um, you know, keep some folks employed and, you know, keep the community fed with some Thai ribs, I hope? (laughs) Sure. We made the bet that if we could really pivot to, um, you know, stand up our takeout business um, as, with as high quality operation as our diamond business was, that we could generate the revenue to keep our managers and key staff working. And um, so far, with a ton of hard work and uh, focus from everyone, we've been able to do that. You know, I think some of the things that we would all point to as um, our success points. One would be we started before everybody else with enhanced sanitation practices. You know, our goal was to uh, make sure we were seen as an essential business and that we had our standards um, as high as a food manufacturing plant. So we've been, uh, you know, checking temps of anybody coming and going out of the building. That's management, ownership, vendors, um, anybody coming in and out has to pass a temperature check. We're in um, the obvious gloves. Um, We've been in masks. We have hair nets. Um, We've got sanitizer everywhere. Um, We have very little product that's exposed, um, you know, on our cook lines. Um, We're we're as clean or cleaner than we've ever been, and we run a really tight operation to begin with. So, you know, we want to have a high standard, and obviously we, we want the public to know that too. And I think we're getting recognized for that. People are, are comfortable that we're a safe place to come get a meal. Um, you know, some of the other things that we've done is, is we we also kind of made the stand that with our, our drive-through or, or um, takeout operations, that if we... Um, dressed for the part that we wanted or, or we you know looked and acted like uh, we we meant it that we were serious about this takeout with our plan and procedures um, that we would be able to quickly put people through and again give them confidence that they could call us for a meal and come get it without a giant hassle yeah I've seen and, um, um, specifically in the lake uh, Clearview parking lot I saw how y'all have that set up the other day when I drove by and then also the Zia at Metairie Road. Um, you have signs they, all they around. They all that. have some. Yeah, they all have some form of that, two to three lanes wide. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, we can really um, put some people through. Now, of course, you know what's going on outside takes a very organized operation inside, and that's taken some form of trial and error and sharing of best practices amongst stores to get to how. You know how we operate a drive-through. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think everybody in the industry knows that it's it's a whole lot harder to do takeout than to put food on a plate. Um, so it takes some extra steps. Um, well, once you're organized, it's certainly something that um, is is feasible to do. Uh, so how yeah. you guys are talking? You told me you were just on the phone with Greg um, prior to this uh, session. What are you guys looking at, like next term, next steps? What is what, what does it look like for you guys? Well, we're uh, we're kind of going into phase two. You know, we, we it's it's amazing that it, we would call a month of operations um, phase one, where we've really you know changed the business over, and uh, we we pretty much have a plan for today and um, and what we would call as normal as you can get operations. So phase two looks like beginning to look at what life is going to be like as restrictions get lifted. But in between there, we're still experiencing 
facing a good volume of business and we're facing the challenges of bringing people back off of furlough and honestly competing with unemployment, right. the federal dollars and the stimulus checks, et cetera. And it's a dual edged sword. Those things are beginning to hit and, um, we're seeing the sales from them. People are spending the money, right. uh, but we're also seeing some people, some of our people on furlough, being a little reluctant to leave the big money to come back um, and uh, and work. And again, the conversations that we're having are, you know, this, it's the the federal money and the unemployment money is very short term, yeah. and they're long term investment. You know, these are a lot of these employees have been with us for years and years. Yeah. Um, the long term investment still, you know, uh, the smart move would be to have it be with us. So, you know, I think everybody's going to struggle a little bit with how to um, run their business with fewer people and compete with the um, the amount of um, stimulus dollars that are out there. So we're we're plotting our plan on that. There's I've got another conference call with the operators today to kind of discuss what we forecast our needs to be, and um, you know we're we're doing things like we're keeping our menu super simple. Um, you know we're we have shrunk it to core and things that you know we can produce um, high quality with fewer people, okay. and. Um, you know, we're ensuring that the people who are working are making great money, and um, you know, we're taking very, very good care of them and making sure that they're staying safe and all those kind of things. But so, you know, I would guess that um, as restrictions begin to be lifted, that as everybody you know believes that social distancing is still going to be something that we're going to need to be able to do, that um, you know, some of the practices that we're already doing are going to stay temperature checks, things like that. Um, and we're looking at some of our businesses, um, well, all of them really, that, you know, the takeout business is going to continue being an important part of our uh, process. Uh, we may have some properties that don't immediately go back to full service. Right. They're productive um, and can be more productive. They may be, you know, productive strictly as drive throughs for a while um, and with simpler menus. And so we're looking no, at all of our options. Yeah. There's no yeah. one size fits all in this. It's and no, and we've never, you know, honestly, as a as a you know um, mid size organization, we we don't operate that anyway. We're, you know, we have properties that have 300 seats in them. Um, we have properties that have 100 seats in them. So we we kind of have to approach each each one of those properties as a individual unit anyway. And you have one property that doesn't sell French fries. <laughs> <laughs> well. The, that yes, original the, Zia, FA, the little the little Zia, um, <laughs> it's so small. It, they don't. There's no fryers. Fry that we don't fry in that building. <laughs> so yeah. we do actually right now on Fridays. Um, uh, we have a we put a couple of extra fryers in the uh, prep kitchen, and we do the seafood on Fridays. Okay. But just one day a week, it takes too many people um, yeah. to do it to be able to do it all the time. Gotcha. Well, thank you for your time and insight. Um, I, you know, love those Thai ribs and those corn grits. And I hope that uh, I'm going to put that, I'm going to put Zio in my rotation for the next few days and make a a, a little visit through the drive through Well, please do. We would be very appreciative of that. All, right. All of our people would. Well, I appreciate your time and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the LRA's Conversations in the COVID Crisis. If you have a story idea, email communications at lra.org. Visit www.lra.org for the latest on COVID-19 resources for restaurateurs. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Until next time, stay safe, everybody. And remember, we at the LRA are working harder than ever for Louisiana's restaurant industry.